So I'm delighted to be able to talk about the use of electronic cigarettes in pregnancy today on behalf of the Smoking and Pregnancy Challenge Group. What I'm going to do is outline the work of the group and then describe some of the latest evidence on electronic cigarettes, looking at their use, their safety, and also what we know about them so far for smoking cessation. Then I'll move on to talk about the evidence we have on electronic cigarettes in pregnancy, which is very limited, but there are some studies underway. And then finally, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about the resources that the challenge group has prepared on e-cigarettes. And these are for midwives and other health professionals, but also a recent resource for women themselves, so they can make informed choices, both about smoking cessation in pregnancy and also electronic cigarettes. So in the United Kingdom, as in many countries, smoking in pregnancy is a public health priority. It's still the main modifiable risk factor for a whole range of poor pregnancy outcomes, and these include things like uh, miscarriage, stillbirth, uh, premature birth, low birth weight, perinatal morbidity and mortality, and of course, sudden infant death. Um, and we know that many babies who are born to mothers who smoke, uh, particularly if they're low birth weight, um, or premature, they're more likely to spend a longer period in hospital um, and they're more likely to have poor health uh, outcomes even later in life. And of course, just to emphasize that uh, for the mother, smoking is still the leading preventable cause of early death and pregnancy provides a unique opportunity for women who smoke to stop. And if they can do that successfully and not relapse after the baby is born, they're far more likely to remain non-smokers in the long term. And in England, we have just over one in 10 women uh, who were known to be smokers at the time they had their baby. Uh, the rates are higher in early pregnancy, uh, but that's still a significant proportion. And those rates are higher than in many other countries. And we estimate that around 70,000 babies were born to mothers who smoke every year in England. So given this background, uh, we've developed the Smoking Pregnancy Challenge Group a number of years ago, and the background to that is that the Tobacco Control Plan for England set national targets to reduce smoking pregnancy rates to 11% by 2015. But in 2012, when we looked at the data, uh, the rate of decline showed signs of slowing. Uh, it really looked like we were not going to meet that national target. And what happened at that time was the, the then public health minister set a challenge to the healthcare community to reduce smoking pregnancy rates. So what we did was we formed a group, the challenge group, coordinated by Action on Smoking and Health, uh, involving the Royal College of Midwives, the Lullaby Trust, Tommies, and a whole range of other organizations uh, to develop a strategy to help achieve the target. And this was really a, a civil society group bringing together researchers, health professionals, advocates, um, and many others. So it's a large group that continues to meet and, and we continue to update both uh, our reporting of the evidence and also recommendations for action. So what we're aiming for today is a new national ambition, which we're hoping will be in a tobacco control plan for England published in 2017, to reach smoking rates of less than 6% uh, in pregnancy by 2020. So a significant decline still needed from where we are now, and that will still be measured in England as smoking at the time of delivery. And these are the reports that we've produced. Initially, the strategy, Smoking Cessation in Pregnancy, a Call to Action, published in 2013. And then in 2015, in October, we reviewed the challenge and pointed out areas where our recommendations were still not being uh, taken up or put in place in the NHS, in local government, and in other organizations in England. And then we focused in particular on some uh, fairly basic but important changes that can be made to the system. The first one is routine carbon monoxide uh, screening. So offering women, all women in fact, a CO test, which identifies whether they've been exposed to carbon monoxide, which can come from different sources, but the primary source of course is if somebody is smoking or is exposed to high levels of secondhand smoke. So we have guidance on that um, and uh, we recommend that that's offered in all parts of the country. We've also produced a whole range of other practical materials, but most recently we produced guidance for midwives and others on e-cigarettes and pregnancy on the basis that we knew women were asking about them as were midwives, and I'll talk about that later. So what about electronic cigarettes? So there is very limited evidence on e-cigarette use in pregnancy, but there's now a substantial amount of evidence on use amongst other adults and also teenagers. 
Um, and what we did last year uh, in April 2016, myself and, and a, a large number of other colleagues who were responsible for authoring a report published by the Tobacco Advisory Group from the Royal College of Physicians. And what that tried to do was bring together all the evidence on e-cigarettes, uh, what we know about them, and also what the unanswered questions are. And much of the data that I'm going to present in the next few minutes comes from that report. So what are e-cigarettes? Uh, in many ways... Oh dear. Sorry, I'm just on a call. I'll ring you back in a couple of minutes. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Uh, in many ways, um, it's important to emphasize that electronic cigarettes are not a single product, but they come in many types. So we began to see the rise of e-cigarettes or common use of electronic cigarettes uh, in, from 2010 in the UK. Um, and when the products were first released, many of them looked like cigarettes. So you'll see uh, the image in the bottom of the slide on the left-hand side is a first-generation e-cigarette, also called a Cigalite. Um, and then we had rechargeable. Uh, first generation e-cigarettes, um, which where the cartridges could be replaced, they're a closed system. And then we moved on to begin to see second generation e-cigarettes produced, which are refillable systems. Uh, you put e-liquid in the e-cigarette, they look a bit like a fountain pen, and obviously they're rechargeable, and, and there are many flavors that can be put in the e-cigarette, um, and the, most e-liquids contain nicotine. And then finally, we've seen later generation, third generation e-cigarettes, uh, tank models, which you see on the far right hand side, far more powerful devices, able to contain more e-liquid and they can also be adapted or modified by the user. But all of these devices have things in common, they have a battery, they have a microprocessor, which controls the heat uh, and light if that's appropriate. There's the cartridge and there's a heater that vaporizes the uh, e-liquid, which is primarily propylene glycol flavorings. Um, and in most cases, nicotine, although some e-cigarettes contain no nicotine. So what do we know about who is using electronic cigarettes? Well, in the Royal College of Physicians report, we pulled together the data from the Smoking Toolkit study, which is a representative survey of smokers and ex-smokers in England uh, conducted regularly. And if we just start with people who currently smoke, you can see on this slide the very rapid rise of e-cigarettes in the blue line from when we started seeing them on the market in the UK in 2010 <clears throat> right up to 2015. And you can see that in that year, um, over one in five smokers were using an electronic cigarette. And also you see the black line is nicotine replacement therapy. Use of NRT has gone down slightly, uh, just under 10% of smokers using NRT. So a very popular product uh, used by many smokers and of course most people who use electronic cigarettes uh, report that they're trying to use these products in order to stop smoking or to cut down their smoking with a view to stopping in the longer term. What about former smokers? Now these are people who've recently quit smoking and you can see here again from 2011 to 2015 really substantial proportion of recent ex-smokers over 40 percent are using an e-cigarette and many of those people or at least some of those people will have, have successfully stopped smoking by using an e-cigarette and at the same time you can see that gradual decline in nicotine replacement therapy. Then on to the more, I suppose, controversial ones. People often ask me, well, what about people who stopped smoking a long time ago? There are these devices are on the market. Won't they just go back to nicotine use? And might that be a bad thing? This shows longer term former smokers. And you can see here the proportions of them using electronic cigarettes is actually very low. It's less than 5% in 2015. And it's very similar to the proportion of long term ex smokers who use nicotine replacement therapy. Um, and those long-term ex-smokers are probably using those devices just because they're concerned about relapse to smoking and they still find nicotine helpful. But they're really low percentages. And then finally and crucially, what about adults age 16 above who've never smoked? And you can see here the rates of e-cigarette use are very low. Note the scale on this slide, which only goes up to half a percent. So it is different. You can see that around 0.3% of never smoking adults in England are using an electronic cigarette. And that's very similar to the proportion of people who've never smoked in their life who use nicotine replacement therapy, which sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? But some never smokers do use NRT and some of them have tried an e-cigarette. But these rates are really low. So in summary for adults, 
E-cigarettes are being used by current smokers to cut down their smoking or to quit, and they're being used by people who've recently stopped smoking to avoid relapse. They're really only being used by a tiny proportion of people who've never smoked or people who quit some time ago. And then what about teenagers, a, a real issue that gets a lot of attention in the press and is a cause for concern. This is an analysis from 2014. I've actually just updated this for the 2016 data and it looks very similar. Four surveys, UK level, Great Britain level, Wales and Scotland, slightly different age groups but all done within the same year. And what you see here is a lot of experimentation with e-cigarettes in teenagers, over 12% in one survey, but levels of regular use are much lower. And you can see the rates for more than monthly or more than weekly are very low. And crucially, amongst teenagers who've never touched a tobacco cigarette, you, again, you can see experimentation up around 5% in, in one particular survey. But regular use, uh, more than monthly or more than weekly, in never smoking teenagers is very, very low. So we're not seeing a new generation of uh, nicotine addicts, so to speak, being recruited by e-cigarettes. But I would emphasize we are continuing to monitor these data very closely. But as I say, in 2016, the experimentation has increased, but we've seen no increase in regular use amongst never smoking teenagers. What about safety? And this is where we get onto the topics that I'm sure will be particularly of interest uh, when we think about pregnant women. So are electronic cigarettes safer than tobacco cigarettes? Well, no, they're not safe. Um, we know there are many things we use uh, that are not safe, but they are safer. So safer equals less harmful. And just in discussions of safety, the appropriate comparator for e-cigarettes, particularly when we're talking about women who smoke, is tobacco. And that includes harm to users and bystanders. So what about e-cigarettes as a harm reduction strategy? Now, in an ideal world, what we'd want to see is that uh, anybody who smokes would stop smoking. They might use nicotine, but eventually they'd stop using nicotine products as well. Um, but for some people, that's more difficult, and for some people, it takes more time. So what do e-cigarettes offer as part of harm reduction? So in contrast to reduced risk cigarettes, which the tobacco industry had a, a history of trying to produce in the past, there's no combustion that takes place in e-cigarettes. They don't burn, and that's important because it's the combustion which causes a lot of the release of toxicants um, and the harmful exposures to formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, some of the heavy metals that we see in tobacco. And in contrast to smokeless tobacco products, things that you would have perhaps heard of like snus and other smokeless products, E-cigarettes are not tobacco products, so they contain nicotine and flavorings, and these can be toxicants, but they're present at much lower levels than in tobacco. And all the evidence suggests that electronic cigarettes are safer than tobacco cigarettes. And very few people actually disagree with that, despite what you read uh, in the press. So how, how much less harmful are they? Now, this is just one example of an estimate originally conducted in 2014, but we looked again at the updated studies for the RCP report, and we came to a very similar conclusion. E-cigarettes are not harmless, but they have around 5% of the risks of smoking, from what we currently know today. Uh, you see cigarettes on one side, very harmful, then onto other products which are also harmful, things like cigars and pipes and shisha or washer pipe. And then on this slide, uh, e-cigarettes appears as ENDS, so electronic nicotine, nicotine delivery systems. And you'll see there, their harm profile is higher than for nicotine replacement therapy, but it's hugely lower than those tobacco products. And one of the reasons for that, this is a complex slide, but I'll just touch on it briefly, is if you directly compare the toxicants in combustible tobacco with those in an electronic cigarette, if you just look at the red numbers, you'll see that for some of the things that we also have in household products, things like formaldehyde and acrolein, uh, the rates are far lower in e-cigarettes. Some of these things are present, but they're either at trace levels or low levels, which, as far as we're aware, don't necessarily pose a risk to human health. And again, just to emphasize, these are not products for people who've never smoked, and they're not products uh, for teenagers who've never uh, smoked a tobacco cigarette. They're products for smokers and ex-smokers, and when you compare the level of toxicants in tobacco with these cigarettes, it's very clear that they're a safer option. What about people standing next to somebody using an e-cigarette? And this is relevant for pregnancy as well. Should we be concerned about secondhand vapor? 
Now we know they release nicotine, but they don't release combustion toxicants, and we also know they release particulate matter, which is shown in this slide, PM2.5, which is how we often measure tobacco smoke. But it's at very low levels, and we don't have any evidence at the moment to ban the use of e-cigarettes um, in all public spaces on health grounds. We might want to restrict their use for other reasons, uh, etiquette, uh, concerns about the fact that some of the devices look like cigarettes and might mimic smoking. We also might be concerned about children seeing us use e-cigarettes. Those might be reasons for restricting use, but not on the basis of health harms to people who are standing near somebody who's vaping. Clearly some of these devices produce huge clouds of vapor and that's not very attractive or appealing and I think we need to address that. But in terms of health harms, we're not seeing that evidence at the moment. And then just for a couple of minutes on smoking cessation, um, this slide briefly just compares e-cigarettes with NRT bought over the counter, NRT on prescription, Champix, which is another stop smoking aid, and then the blue line are our stop smoking services in England. You can see the huge rise in e-cigarette use from 2009, and in e-cigarette use, e-cigarettes are now the most popular approach to stopping smoking, and they're used in more than one in three quit attempts. Uh, are e-cigarettes effective in helping people quit? So this is the Cochrane Review. Uh, many of you will know Cochrane is the gold standard for evidence synthesis in healthcare. And they updated their review last year. There are still only two good quality trials. Um, there are 15 ongoing trials, one of them about starting pregnancy that I'll talk about. Um, and overall, e-cigarettes as they're currently made um, are about as effective as a nicotine patch and I should emphasize the two existing trials actually used early devices that are no longer on the market but at least we have some randomized controlled evidence controlled trial evidence that suggests uh, they're about as effective as a single NRT product more recent data um, just to summarize, I won't go into all of this detail, but three studies. And the one that I often find helpful to cite was one from the UK, the first one on this list, that showed that people who used an electronic cigarette to quit smoking were around 60% more successful in achieving that than those who used willpower alone, so no help, or those who bought a nicotine replacement therapy over the counter. And as a result of all of this evidence, we now have guidance, uh, two forms, one from NICE on the original harm reduction guidance, which encourages people to use nicotine containing products to cut down and in the longer term to avoid relapse from smoking. But more recently, the National Center on Smoking Cessation and Training, which recommends that stop smoking services be open to e-cigarette use, talk to smokers about them, and encourage them to use them, particularly if they've used other aids to stop smoking in the past and have been unsuccessful. We can't prescribe these products. Uh, I understand there is a question on this. We don't have any licensed e-cigarettes, so I will answer that question at the end. But we can point people in the direction of the devices, and really importantly from my perspective, uh, be honest and open with people about what we do know and what we don't know. And then obviously people will have heard about exploding batteries and some other concerns about e-cigarettes, maybe even nicotine poisoning. We have guidance from um, the Royal uh, Society for the Prevention of Accidents, the references at the end, and there's things that we can do to make sure that those risks are minimized, including importantly to children. Unfortunately, I think because of a lot of the media uh, hype about e-cigarettes, uh, when you ask the UK population do they believe e-cigarettes are more or equally harmful than tobacco, less harmful, a lot less harmful, completely harmless, or they don't know, a lot of people don't know. But if you just look at the first set of bars, you can see that the proportion of people who believe that e-cigarettes were more or equally harmful than tobacco has increased every year. Um, and that's a concern to us because uh, for yourselves as healthcare professionals and for those of us working in the field, uh, we need to make sure that people have accurate information about these devices. So what about pregnancy? We only have two small surveys and qualitative studies on vaping and pregnancy. Uh, we know that women who smoke, uh, well, pregnant women who smoke are using these devices. It could be up to one in four pregnant women who've tried them in some parts of the UK. Um, we certainly have some evidence from that, from the work we've done in our qualitative study and preliminary work for a national survey. So what risks should we be concerned about? So the first thing to emphasize is that nicotine is not the problem. 
We know that nicotine replacement therapy in pregnancy is safe and it's licensed and widely used in the UK. And Sue Cooper and Tim Coleman's study followed infants of children of mothers who'd used NRT for two years um, and found no adverse effects on the infant. So it might be other things in e-cigarettes that we need more research about. Some of those toxicants that I showed you earlier, some of the other constituents. And we will have those studies fairly soon. Vaping around babies and children is unlikely to confer significant risk, but Public Health England has advice on this, particularly for uh, employers. So I don't think we'd want to see a childcare establishment, for example, that allowed its staff to vape necessarily around children in that establishment, and that, that is important. So more evidence on use in pregnancy is needed, and particularly in relation to effectiveness for smoking cessation. We are about to start a large randomized control trial. Uh, we need CTIMP uh, MHRA approval for this, so it will be some months and still, until we start to recruit, but we'll randomize women to normal stop smoking support with NRT and the other arm to receiving stop smoking behavioral support and an e-cigarette. Uh, so that evidence will be available soon. But at the moment, what I'd suggest uh, to those of us working in this area is that we need to use, in a pragmatic way, what we know about e-cigarettes generally and the harms from smoking and pregnancy specifically in order to best support women. I mean, the reality is women are using these devices. Many women will be asking you questions about these devices. Um, let's, let's be clear with them that there are lots of things we don't know, but what we do know is how harmful smoking is. And from my understanding of what we see in the study so far, if women are struggling to stop with traditional approaches, we really shouldn't be discouraging them uh, from using e-cigarettes. And just to conclude then, for that reason, we've produced two practical um, bits of uh, advice for midwives and other healthcare professionals. The first one is the leaflet on e-cigarettes in pregnancy. Um, I'm sure many of you will have looked at this. It just sets out basic questions like what are e-cigarettes, are they safe to use, is there carbon monoxide in them? What about the risks of nicotine? Uh, are they effective for smoking cessation? What if a partner or a husband wants to use an e-cigarette? Can I use an e-cigarette around the baby? Uh, are there recommended brands? Can I keep smoking a little bit if I'm also using an e-cigarette? And the advice obviously clearly there is to stop smoking entirely. So questions like that are addressed in the leaflet. And then more recently, just briefly, we produced a practical infographic for pregnant women, a single sheet that women can be handed or a resource they can be pointed to online that emphasize the risks of smoking, clearly emphasize the, risks of stop, uh, the benefits of stopping, but also indicate that using an e-cigarette is far safer than continuing to smoke. So these are some of the resources from the Smoking and Pregnancy Challenge Group. I hope you found that useful and informative. I'd encourage you to look at these if you can. Um, and I know my colleagues who are on the line are available to answer questions, as am I, and I look forward to the discussion. So thank you very much. Hi, sorry about that, a couple of technical difficulties, but um, thank you very much, Linda. That was really, really, really helpful. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce the rest of the panelists now and also to encourage, if you are listening, that we can still take uh, questions, any questions you might have on Linda's presentation. Um, so joining us for the discussion, we have Sarah Fox, who is the Professional Policy Advisor at the Royal College of Midwives. Hilary Waring, who is the Director of Improving Performance in Practice, and Joe Locker, who is the Tobacco Control Manager at um, Public Health England. Um, just a quick question to each of the panellists. Is there anything that you'd like to add um, or to sort of pick up from Linda's presentation coming at it from your perspective? Shall I start? It's Sarah Fox here. Can you hear me? Yes, Sarah. Yes, that would be ah, great. Thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. Well, it was an amazing presentation, Linda. Thank you so much. I found it really helpful, and I think it's really clear um, and concise message will be really helpful to midwives out there. So, thank you. I know that women are asking midwives a lot about e-cigarettes, and I know that midwives are struggling to um, give. A positive message in the absence of robust evidence. So I think um, 
given a very clear line that we recommend stop smoking services and nicotine replacement therapy, but where women choose not to use those services or um, have been unsuccessful using those services, that we would not discourage them from um, using e-cigarettes is a really helpful message for us all to be able to give very clearly to women out there. Thank you. Thank you. And Joe, is there anything that you'd uh, Joe Lockett, is there anything that you'd like to add from Linda's presentation? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sarah, and thanks to Linda as well. That covered um, a lot of the questions that I get asked um, as well on the issue of um, uh, smoking and pregnancy and use of e-cigarettes. And to emphasise that the challenge group resource, both the infographic, the one pager, and the um, briefing document have been incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, one question that we haven't covered that I do also get asked is around the recording of um, women who are vaping at uh, time of delivery as part of the SATOD um, smoking at time of delivery data. So just to clarify um, that those women who are vaping at time of delivery but not smoking any tobacco at all, so they're just using electronic cigarettes, they are to be recorded as non-smokers, as not smoking. Any woman who's dual using, so continuing to smoke some tobacco and also using an e-cigarette would be recorded as smoking. But, um, but just to be clear, that any woman vaping only uh, uh, to be recorded as a non-smoker at time of delivery. So I hope that, that clarifies that question, if anybody had that one in their, in their mind still. Thanks, Joe. And Hilary, is there anything that you'd like to add from Linda's presentation? Yeah, I think um, kind of adding from Linda's, but also from what Sarah and Joe said, um, talking to the midwives when we're at train, training with them is exactly, you know, just kind of having time for them to think through what they're actually going to say to women and having those discussions in their, in the, perhaps in their team meetings. And we, we've certainly got a video of one of our midwives actually having that conversation, which might be useful um, in actually prompting that discussion to think, how's that going to sound and rehearsing it before they get in, into that situation with individual, um, with individual women, I think might be very useful because I think um, it's that kind of balance between not promoting them but also supporting women for choosing that route. I think also just to say from the work we've been doing with Tommies and the large amount of interviews we've undertaken with women, it's certainly being seen as a way of not smoking during pregnancy by numerous women we talk to and at the moment they are thinking it's something that they can't do with services and I think from a midwife's perspective one of the things they can do and be really useful is encourage those women to feel confident that they can use their e-cigarette and go and get support from the Stop Smoking Services, that's really important. Great, thanks Hilary. Um, so the first question that we've had from the audience is, um, what are the levels of nicotine in e-liquids? Um, okay, sure. yep. yep, do you want me Linda. to that? Sure. So one of the really interesting things about e-cigarettes is that they come in different nicotine strengths, many more nicotine strengths than do NRT, for example. So they actually allow people to gradually reduce their nicotine content in a more sophisticated way than with nicotine replacement therapy. So as I mentioned, you have some e-liquids that have zero nicotine, and they go up from that to 3 uh, milligrams per milliliter, 6 milligrams per milliliter, uh, 12, 18, and then the current EU limit is 20 milligrams per milliliter. So I haven't had a chance in this presentation and the brief time to mention the U European Tobacco Products Directive, which was transposed into UK law last May. It sets quality standards, it requires the um, manufacturers to notify about their products and um, give a lot of um, detailed uh, information about what's in them. It also requires a nicotine label, childproof caps, um, and a specific size of refillable containers, uh, really to protect children. And of course, we've also introduced a of sale. Um, so that, that's what we know about nicotine content. So the, the content of the nicotine is restricted now by law uh, and companies have to comply with that. Thanks Linda. Um, and another question around um, nicotine which is about harm and nicotine. So what is the latest evidence around harm specifically from nicotine in pregnancy 
Um, in particular, we can say it is safer than smoking, but we can say it is relatively safe to use in, but can we say it is relatively safe to use in pregnancy? We are beginning to differentiate between smoking and nicotine only use when screening for trisomies, I think I pronounced that right, in the mid trimester. Um, I think Linda and Sarah, are you able to respond to that question? Sure. Do you want me to start? Yes, please. Yeah, Okay, so um, you may have seen things in the press and other places about the harmful effects of nicotine in pregnancy. In fact, there was a Surgeon General's report from the US that mentioned that again just a couple of months ago. I think it's really important to emphasize that that evidence comes from what we call rodent models. It comes from mice studies, where the mice were exposed to nicotine and not tobacco, um, and they saw some potentially adverse effects on their offspring. We don't have that evidence in humans. Um, and medicinal nicotine in particular, uh, we have a very strong randomized control trial that I mentioned that followed the babies up to two years and so on, no adverse effects. So uh, the key emphasis, of course, must be on the fact that the contrast is with tobacco and tobacco is so harmful. And I don't think we'd want all pregnant women out there in England to suddenly start using nicotine uh, because they don't need to use it and there's no, there are no health benefits to it or, or very small ones and, and certainly none in pregnancy. Um, so that's what we know. So I think we can confidently convey that message that we shouldn't be concerned about nicotine. We might have questions about other toxicants, but, but not that particular compound. Thanks. And Sarah, do you have anything to add um, in terms of advice about nicotine from a midwife's perspective? Uh, I mean, I certainly concur with, with what Linda said. I mean, I think often women aren't... Um, um, asking specifically about different constituents and I think it's important knowledge for midwives to know um, in some detail the evidence but I think a lot of women just want us to say is it safe or not and that is that is often very hard for midwives to be absolutely clear on. I think what we can be absolutely clear on and we must be very clear with all women is that it is clearly safer than smoking and um, we would um, encourage all women to um, try and be smoke free and if e-cigarettes support them to do that then we would absolutely support them to, to, to use that method um, but we need to be honest and they are relatively new and there is a relatively limited evidence base but certainly the evidence base suggests overwhelmingly they are more safe and less harmful than smoking. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, how likely is it that women continue to use e-cigarettes after birth rather than return to smoking? Um, and I, for this one, Linda, I don't know if there is, if you have evidence on this and then I'll open it up to the other panelists. Okay, so all we have so far is the qualitative study we've been doing in England where we recruited 50 women who were vaping during pregnancy. Um, so if I just talk about their experience, but also just to emphasize, there is a study that's just been funded that looks specifically at e-cigarettes uh, e for relapse prevention immediately post-birth. So basically looking at whether women can continue to use them because just to emphasize, I'm, I'm sure many colleagues know that the relapse rates to smoking post-birth are incredibly high. They continue to be well above 60% including in the early uh, weeks of um, after birth. So it's a huge challenge um, supporting women not to go back to cigarettes. So I think they look promising, but we, we don't have strong data on that. Interestingly, in our qualitative study, we found that a lot of the women who were vaping were actually really unsure about e-cigarettes, not surprisingly. They felt quite guilty, really, really guilty about using them in pregnancy, even if they weren't smoking. That's why these messages are so important. But once the baby was born, they actually felt much more confident about continuing to use their e-cigarette in order to help them not go back to tobacco. Hilary, do you have anything to add um, on any projects that you're aware of that are looking at this? Using yeah, e I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the key things I I would say is because this is is a new and emerging area. I know that a lot of midwives are, you know, still gaining confidence to really have those conversations. And I hope you will agree that I think um, the stop smoking services are most likely having the opportunity to spend a lot more time discussing this and understanding it. So where the midwives maybe aren't as confident in giving some of the messages is to encourage the women to talk to the advisors who will be able to have a more in-depth conversation with them. 
So, you know, it's not just about referring to the stop smoking services for a quit. It, it may be helpful to say to the women, you can have the conversation. Even on the phone, you can have the conversation with an advisor who will have a, a more in-depth knowledge to answer some of your questions. Thanks, Hilary. Um, another question on nicotine levels. If you are a heavy smoking pregnant mother using an e-cigarette, should she be starting at the highest level of nicotine and reducing the levels throughout the pregnancy? Um, Hilary, I'm going to go to you first on this one, um, and then I'm going to ask Linda. Um, so we're talking about women who are using e-cigarettes. Should they be reducing? Yeah. Is that, is that, is that the question? Um, from my perspective, it would be allowing the woman to use um, the e-cigarette in a way and to a level that allowed her to have the, the, the dose that she needs not to go back to smoking at that stage. Because for me, that would be the imperative. So, you know, not to be encouraging higher use. And, and you know, Linda and we will say more, but most people, you know, don't overuse. Uh, if anything, they underuse, but they, you know, they will take what they need. But it's about her having what she needs to enable her not to go back to smoking. But Linda, you may have more to say on that. Well, I think the first thing to emphasize is that many people are worried about things like nicotine overdose. You know, we hear about that a lot. So is somebody still smoking and using an e-cigarette, a heavy uh, pregnant smoker? Actually, overdosing on nicotine is incredibly difficult because what happens is that it produces a lot of nausea, nausea and uh, women are sick. That's what happens. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to do that. The other emphasis I would place is I would actually agree that if a woman is, for example, still smoking a 20 a day and is pregnant, then she needs to use a, a nicotine containing e-cigarette. There's probably near that 20 milligrams per milliliter limit because the risk is if she doesn't use one that has enough nicotine, she won't find the e-cigarette helpful and then she'll reach for the cigarettes again. And so I wouldn't dissuade women who are heavy smokers from using a higher nicotine concentration, but to emphasize that the priority then should be if she chooses to, to gradually reduce that nicotine content as she becomes more confident in her quit attempt. Thanks Linda. Um, I think we have time for one or maybe two more questions. Um, so one about uh, selection. Are we still unable to help with e-cigarette or vape selection? We often are asked which products are safest. Jo, are you able to answer that question? Um, I think it's um, it, the it, it's again it's up to the uh, up, up to the woman to, um, to 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 choose her product and there are there aren't currently any licensed products as um, as Linda mentioned early on so there aren't any um, products that can be prescribed and therefore specifically recommended um, and there are lots of different products out there as well so the advice remains that uh, as Sarah and Linda have um, have said the e-cigarettes generally as as a product are a lot safer than smoking and that's our that's our comparator um, but it's not really possible to recommend or direct people to one or the other there are lots of different ones out there um, but we wouldn't really be expecting a, um, the, the midwives to be able to, um, to to direct people to to one one specific product or another but the generic information the generic advice applies that they're a lot safer than, than smoking and it's finding the right product that that works for you okay yeah. thanks Jim sorry can I just add to that so the only other of thing course. very briefly is that um, so again, Hillary's point is really important here. The stop smoking services have this local knowledge. So uh, stop smoking services, many of them have made links with vape shops um, and independent providers with no links to the tobacco industry. Uh, the later generation devices tend to be more effective than those sigillites that I talked about. But again, that kind of detailed discussion is probably more appropriate between the stop smoking service and the pregnant women than something that midwives need to be spending a lot of time updating themselves on. Thanks, Linda. I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to just ask one more question before we uh, round off, which is: How possible is it for all maternity services to put up the infographic one page in waiting rooms, ultrasound rooms, etc., just to get the message across in case midwives mm. may not have covered it in the consultation? And um, I'm going to ask Hillary for her perspective on that first. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not sure at the moment whether I would see the infographic on its own as something I would put up as a poster. I think it needs to be, um, because this is such an emerging area, I think it's um, better if that is given by the midwife in a conversation with the woman to the women that it's appropriate to uh, and potentially for other professionals as well to have access to that infographic to give it to the women. I know that's sometimes a challenge to, to even get those printed and that's something that we are discussing in the challenge group because we know how useful things like having test your breast um, cards um, for midwives to give out um, has been. but personally I'm not sure I would particularly see that as something that should stand alone outside that conversation but um, Joe, I don't know whether you've got a view on that or Sarah Joe, do you have anything yeah. to add from um, no, no, nothing to add really, I think I, I agree with, with Hilary, I'm not, the, the, the product, the infographic was really intended to be used um, in as a conversation piece and to provide further further information um, I think if we're we're thinking about the um, the number of women who this would apply to as well um, as you say it's 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 the number of women who are who are smoking and then the number of women who are interested in e-cigarettes numbers are going to be relatively small as much as this is a really vital issue to talk about the numbers will still be relatively relatively small so having it as a as a display piece that's um, that's available for everybody not not sure we're we're um, we're in that kind of space that we need to need to do that at the moment but as a conversation piece as a bit of further information to um to give to people that midwives are having this conversation with i think that's where this um, document would be best best used Thank you very much. Sarah, do you I, have can I, to can I, Yeah, can I just add? Um, I absolutely agree with Jo and Hilary. Um, they're certainly, we're not planning or moving in the direction where we're um, encouraging, um, sort of mandating of uh, putting posters or signs up. If individual health um, maternity services felt that there was, um, there was enough um, interest generated to feel that it would be appropriate to um, make it available in for example an antenatal clinic uh, waiting room then that would be their own individual decision um, and I'm sure there would be clear reasons for that what I would urge is that if, if they are um, if, if information is being um, put out in a form of a poster that midwives ensure there is midwifery staff available to give clarity to the message and put the message in context for each individual woman because um, you know clearly um, it needs to be relevant to the individual woman having said that we know that women are asking questions about e-cigarettes and want information so I would encourage midwives to feel comfortable to open up conversations about e-cigarettes where it is relevant for individual women and to have um, a level of knowledge in the area to be able to advise them um, on the next step forward. Thanks Sarah. Um, I, Sarah, uh, oh, yeah. sorry. Jo, um, just to add to what Sarah was saying, um, uh, the midwives having you know that that level of information that they can have a conversation. Um, thinking about the infographic, the the. The, the basic information is there, but um, if um, if midwives were able to have a look through the other challenge group um, qu uh, question and answer do document with a little bit more detail, it's still only about Absolutely. six or seven pages, mm -hmm. I think. That's mm -hmm. where you'll find, I think, enough information to enable you to have that um, that slightly more more in-depth conversation, and then signposting on to the uh, to the stop smoking service if, if if more is needed. But for the midwives to use those two documents in in tandem, I think would be most um, most useful. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm afraid we have run out of time for this morning's webinar. We've had a lot of um, excellent questions and we haven't been able to answer all of them today, but we will be sending around a uh, question and answer document and we'll be circulating that around as soon as possible. So any questions we haven't had a chance to answer today, we will be answering and sending that round to participants later on. Um, I'd like to thank Linda, uh, and Sarah, Hillary and Joe for your time and contribution this morning. I think that this was a, a really interesting and 
helpful conversation um, about a topic that we know um, is, is being asked about increasingly and it's been really really helpful to hear from you all about um, e-cigarettes and pregnancy. We will be circulating a link to all of the resources that have been mentioned on the webinar this morning as well as um, a, a, a link to the webinar itself and all of the resources are available from the challenge group website and we'll um, as I said send a link around to that uh, as soon as possible with a question and answer document. So I'd like to thank everybody for their time today um, and I hope that everybody who's able to listen in found it really helpful in terms of improving their practice. Thank you.